Let us worship God. We receive our prelude this morning. Amen. So let us join together in our call to worship as found in the worship order. God summons all the earth. God speaks, we gather to listen. Through all creation, God shines forth. God joins us together, we live faithfully. The one who deserves great thanksgiving is ready to hear our praise. With grateful hearts, we honor the Lord our God. Alleluia. Together, let us worship God. Let us sing together Christ whose glory fills the sky. Christ, whose glory fills the skies, Christ, the true, the only ones, Son of righteousness, arise, triumph and the shades of light, they spring from the light beneath, they start Scatter 
As God's people, we recommit to spreading the light all around us in 2021. Let us light, can light candles to remind us of God's call to spread the light. Let us pray together. Holy God, all glory is due to you. For you are our loving creator, our steadfast redeemer, and our ever-present sustainer. Forgive us for failing in our trust of you. Forgive us for going through the motions of our days instead of living courageously as your shining light in this world. Forgive us for being afraid to follow wherever your spirit might lead for the sake of all you love. Hear the prayers we make to you in the quiet of this time. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercy never comes to an end. Trust the good news. In Christ we are made new. Through Christ we live. All right, where are my children's? Um, so today is Valentine's Day. I'm going to try to cut a valentine. And I don't know if you all know, but Valentine's Day actually is the feast day of St. Valentine's. Now, we are not entirely sure, I have to take these off, we are not entirely sure St. Valentine can be one of two people, as far as we know, St. Valentine was either living in Rome. Well, we know he was living in the third century and we know that St. Valentine was living before the Roman Empire accepted Christianity as an acceptable religion. And so there's a lot of legends about St. Valentine's. I hope you know that Valentine's, you know, that's how we got Valentine's Day. So um, there's a lot of legends about St. Valentine. Um, one of my favorite legends about St. Valentine is that he was um, a priest in Rome before anything like a pope. And St. Valentine did a very risky thing going against the orders of the emperor and married Christian people. They were not allowed to marry because the emperor was tried at that time they only had men in their armies and the empire the emperor was trying to get the men to like fight for his army he didn't want anybody wanting to stay at home and like love somebody so he was not happy at all with saint valentine now there's another um legend and all of it could be true that saint valentine actually before he became a saint um, they, they think he might have been a bishop as well. Not a lot of clarity there, but he was either a priest or a bishop. And that there, what, he was in jail because of all these reckless things he was doing, like living on the side of love, and the emperor didn't like that. And so St. Valentine was in jail, and the jailer's daughter actually was blind. And this grieved the heart of the jailer's daughter. So St. Valentine healed her. And the jailer was like absolutely amazed she could see again. And one of the legends is that um, Valentine was um, executed by the emperor. He became a martyr in um, the third, early third century. But the night before he was executed, cut out a little heart and he signed his little heart for the jailer's daughter, this young girl who was totally pure, loving, and innocent. And he made a little heart and he signed it, your Valentine. Isn't that sweet? As part of why we get this whole make hearts, write little notes to your Valentine. So 
I am learning about this right now in social studies. So can we let Cece on so she can tell what she knows about St. Valentine? We're actually not um, specifically talking about St. Valentine, but we are talking about like um, the Mardars and people like that. And the Roman Empire? Yeah. Well, and what, what we're doing right now. Oh, I can't hear you. Say that again. The Roman Empire just collapsed. Collapsed. What I'm eventually, doesn't it? Why did the Roman Empire collapse, CC? Because they couldn't stop fighting on who would have the most power, so they were gullible to other people, to other armies and um, other people, and then they collapsed because of that. They're too vulnerable, right? The military expenditures exceeded everything else. So I just thought it'd be fun on St. Valentine's Day to attempt to make an appropriate little Valentine. Hopefully, you know, I don't care if you have like a sweetheart or whatever, or if you're partnered or not at home, I don't care. I just know that there is a lot of love in this world and we can celebrate it. One of my dear, dear friends in college told me, she said, Jewel, it doesn't matter. There is always going to be love in your life, no matter if you have a spouse or not. So I hope, look at my little Valentine. Can you see that? I hope that you, like it's my snowflake Valentine for today. I hope that you find a way to celebrate love today and to remember that, you know, there are always going to be those who are against the side of love. But as followers of Jesus, we just keep on loving because that's what Jesus did. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for the gift of love, which we learn exactly from you because you are love itself. And every time we experience love in our lives, whatever that love looks like, we are experiencing and can celebrate your presence, you in our midst. Thank you, oh God, for this gift and for those throughout history who have lived on the side of love and have risked their lives for the side of love and have even died for the sake of love. Be with us all this week, keeping our eyes open to finding love in our lives and to celebrating and spreading that love wherever we go. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let us continue to worship with some music as I clean up my Valentine mess.
In preparation to hear God's word, let us pray. Holy God, we quiet ourselves and the concerns of our lives to listen for your voice. We long to hear that we might be renewed and ready to follow in the rays of Christ. Speak for we are listening. Through Christ we pray. Amen. The first reading is from 2 King chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Listen for God's word to us. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know, keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. 50 men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to on one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do to, for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see them, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our next reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Listen for God's word to us. Six days later... Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, he ordered them 
to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a beautiful sermon on the transfiguration of Jesus, according to the Gospel of Matthew, that is available on dayone.org, Barbara Brown Taylor reminds that some things are not meant to be dissected. Some Bible texts are there to bring us to the point of awe, wonder, encounter with the story of encounters with the presence, capital P, presence, which is God. The transfiguration of Jesus that I just read is just such a text. Pulling us into an awesome encounter with the divine, shining like the brightest light through Jesus. All the while enveloped in the shadowy cloud, God has showed up in again and again. So imagine six days earlier, having been put in your place by Jesus. He just has told his disciples where his path was going. There's something about living a life on the side of love that runs us into opposition. According to the way the Gospels tell the story, Jesus just kept on living love, no matter the surrounding conventions, regardless of the consequences, just like those martyrs Cece's learning about. He called for allegiance to that kind of reign, which Jesus named the kingdom of God. When those in front of him thought that they had it all figured out, he would just twist and turn a little bit to remind them not to be so sure. Because more than theological certainties, God always has been about trust. I dare say it is a human tendency to prefer certainty, to avoid the angst of change that life inevitably brings so that somewhere within each of us, the path Jesus was living pushes up against our limits. And because of it, no matter how much good he did, he was heading for a heap of pain. In Caesarea Philippi, Jesus told his disciples plainly, he would suffer at the hands of human beings, he would die, but he would rise again. If you want to be my followers, he instructed, get behind me on this path that will leave you walking in the same direction. Perhaps you recall spokesperson's Peter's response there in Caesarea Philippi, in protest, he shouts, no, it never shall be. You know, because wouldn't it be wonderful if following the way of God meant nothing but sunny skies of smooth sailing? Jesus knows better and emphatically tells Peter, step off, Satan. You are focusing on the ways of the world, not the path of God. Ooh. To be called out in front of everyone for being your beloved leader's tempter. The voice of the tester come to see if Jesus will keep to God's path. Six days later, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and up a mountain they go. I suspect Peter's ego still was a little bit sore, having been called Satan just a week before. Perhaps they traveled in icy silence. They were heading up to pray, calves aching, brows sweating as up, up, up they climbed. As Jewish men, they had to know how often mountains were the place their people had encountered the divine Surely they realized Jesus wasn't just dragging them out for an afternoon stroll. Those of us who would prefer to be out on the trail Sunday mornings instead of stuck in a sanctuary pew could tell a thing or two about what to expect at the top of a peak. After the arduous climb, the descending peace, glorious views, often a presence shows up. 
out in nature, being one of the best places we can clear our head and calm our souls and commune with the great creator. The Gospel of Mark doesn't give nearly the embellishments as does Matthew and Luke. Nonetheless, look at it, catching their breath at the top. Peter, James, and John stand aback at Jesus blazing gloriously before them. The Shekinah of God, as rabbinical literature would call it, the glorious divine presence the brilliant light that shone on Moses' face after he too went up a mountain and the overshadowing cloud, the dwelling of the Lord that tabernacled among the wilderness people and was believed at last to enter the Holy of Holies of the Jerusalem temple. Translucent, God shines through Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The figures of Moses and Elijah seen too. Peter suggests tents, three of them, constructions in which each one of them might dwell. Then the cloud overshadows, and though the scene overflows with visual stimulation, it is a voice at last that speaks. Listen to him, my beloved, the words burn inside out. Then in an instant, it's all over. The light, the cloud, the companion figures, even the voice vanish as quickly as it all had come. Encounters with God are like that, aren't they? We would love for it to be different. The mystical, seemingly making clear the presence in our lives, God in our midst, the, the manifestation of the divine. We want that to stay with us always. Though some traditions insist adherents produce such evidence of encounters as signs of true faith, most of us likely live daily with the hiddenness of God, the shadowy cloud of faith. As the mid 19th century hymn that quotes 2 Corinthians puts it, we walk by faith, not by sight. And yet we believe God here, present in hiddenness, mysteriously glimpsed through encounter, then elusively vanish before we even understand what we just saw. Mystics across the centuries have railed against God's peekaboo ways, and yet how else would we have it? None of us can sustain life on the mountaintop. The perpetual bright light eventually would just dull our sight, the total absence of God would be hell itself. Somewhere in the middle makes the most sense. So we have a chance to figure out how to live this interesting experience of being the intersection of God infused flesh in the particularity of each one of us. It would be wonderful to be able to control the very moments at which our bright shining God encounters take place so that in the deepest valleys we would instantaneously be pulled out. But what then of any human agency? What then of a God as sovereign rather than a puppet whose strings we master? If there is one thing as Christians we can trust, at least according to the ways the Gospels tell the story of encounter with the presence as witnessed in the transfiguration of Jesus, it is this. The voice to which we are directed to listen. The Christ from whom we are to learn. In that sermon by Barbara Brown Taylor, she reminds that the transfiguration of Jesus is the story between the twinkling lights of Christmas and the wilderness of Lent. We are heading into the intentional season where the flash of it all is stripped away. As Jesus teaches in word and deed, it is a cross first before the blaze of resurrection morning.
this constant movement between suffering and glory, death and life, the dazzling light and the quiet withdrawal. We need a season to get us ready. We need a time to ponder more deeply the mystery before us of how we lose our life in order to truly live. How we die here and now in order to live now and forever. If it doesn't make a lot of sense, then maybe we are exactly where God wants us to be. Continually open to listening. Humble enough to follow as we keep searching through any shadowy fog. Notice one important thing. We are not alone on the journey. Which is great news when the light shines brightly and an even better gift on days God's hiddenness is all we can find. As if God has withdrawn. Hopefully we are learning to grab hands with those around us as we walk with each other towards home. In the name of the life-giving Father, the life-redeeming Son, and the life-sustaining Spirit. Amen. In a moment of silence this morning, let us just pause to listen for God's word to us that has come through scripture read and proclaimed. Holy One, we give you great thanks that we are not alone on this journey because there are days we feel all by ourselves as if you are hidden and gone, as if we are stuck in our isolation. But we are not alone and you are present. You always are present, even if we are unable to see. Thank you, O oh God, for the gift of those glimpses, those moments, sometimes once in a lifetime, when we know and see you clearly working in our lives. And thank you, O oh God, for the community around us with whom we can share these moments, the twinkling joy of great encounters with you. We offer our prayers to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, who is calling us through death to life to follow. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. We are going to affirm our faith today using words from a brief statement of faith as found in the worship order. We're not going to stand so that only see belly buttons. We're just going to stay seated and profess the Christian faith together. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. 
We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the church. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As God's people, we offer our prayers for the world, our neighbors, and one another. So let us turn together to pray. Holy God, mysterious presence, hidden one. In trust of you through it all, we bring the joys and concerns of our lives. You amaze with wonder, you satisfy with joy. You restore hope. Thank you for making a world of such beauty and sheltering us amid life's greatest difficulties. Thank you for teaching us an ancient story and leading us today in the complexities all around. Our hearts ache at the injustices woven by human failings and the divides we continue to make. Our spirits grow weary of loss and tired of destruction and worried over ever-present illness. Bring mercy and peace and rest, we pray, for all who suffer this day. Be hope for those who mourn and sanctuary for those needing respite. Go with us as we companion one another in times of challenge and triumph. Renew community in this city and nation and world that all will experience the presence even on the days you seem furthest away. Hear our prayers, O oh God, for every kind of human need and ready us to enter into the season of Lent when we grapple with the mystery of dying to truly live here and now and forevermore. We offer our prayers to you, O God, in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give thanks to God for all the ways God is present, whether we can see or not. And we are grateful for each other to walk the journey of faith together. In support of all the ways God works in, through, and among us to be the church needed in this world, we give freely of our time, talents, and treasures. Financial offerings can be given by mailing checks to the church facility at 6220 Hickory Valley Road. We also can give online at www.hillwoodpc.org. Before we depart Zoom worship today, we join to sing We Will Walk by Faith and God, um, and we will walk with God and Max will lead us in this song together.
disciples of the risen Christ in the brightness of God's shining light, in the shadowy hiddenness that calls us to deeper faith, let us go to love and serve like Christ. Go remembering that God does bless you and keep you. God is kind and gracious to you. God looks upon you with favor and will give you peace forever. Amen. Max will lead us in our postlude, and any who want to stay for a time of fellowship after will join together for a few mo moments. <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much, Max.